It is time for us to get started tonight. We are thankful you've chosen to be with us on this rainy Wednesday evening. So thankful that uh, we have this opportunity to meet together and study from the Word of God. And hopefully tonight we'll be blessed by the studies that we're able to do in our various classes. Just a couple of announcements that we want to make before we move on tonight. Uh, Dortha Lawler, who is Philip uh, Lawler's mother, she's not doing well at this particular time. And so please keep her in your prayers. And then also, Brother Bill Hyde will be undergoing eye surgery tomorrow on the other eye. He'd had cataract surgery, and now he's going back for the other eye. So please keep him in your prayers as well. Are there others who are sick or who need our prayers that we need to mention tonight? I know they are those who are in the bulletin, been on the screen tonight as well. Is there anyone that we need to add? Okay. Ronnie Brown, hip replacement next Tuesday in Birmingham at St. Vincent's. So keep Ronnie, Ronnie Brown in your prayers as well. Anybody else? If not, our opening prayer tonight will be led by Brother Bobby Nunley. Our singing will be led by Grant Addison. I'll be doing the 90 seconds of power, and then following all of those, we will be dismissing for our classes. Brother Bobby. Pray with me, please. Our God and our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy great and holy name. We come to thee, Heavenly Father, thanking you for this opportunity that you provide for us to come out and to study thy word, that we can apply it to our lives, that we can be better servants to you. And we're so thankful, Heavenly Father, for the many things that you provide for us that we have here on this earth and that we take for granted each day that we have. So thankful, Heavenly Father, for our health that we have. Thank you for sparing our lives down to this moment. Continue to help us do the things that we need to do and serve you as we should. Pray, Heavenly Father, that I will be with those that's uh, sick, especially those, Heavenly Father, that's going to have operations, be with Ronnie and Billy and Miss Lawler, be with all of them, Heavenly Father, request their prayer and be with them and help them to be restored to their health, be with the doctors and the nurses that take care of them, help them to have uh, good luck in doing the things that they're doing, strengthen them daily in their love and care. We pray, Heavenly Father, that I will be with those that's on the foreign soil preaching and teaching the gospel. Pray that I will be with uh, Eddie Bull and Randall, be with them, help them to continue to do what they're doing. They're, they're doing good works, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that I will continue to be with them and help them, Heavenly Father, to have a safe trip back home and be with their families. And pray, Heavenly Father, that I will be with us and help us and do the things that we need to do. Be with those, Heavenly Father that preaches and teaches us the gospel. Pray that I will be with Mark as he, pre as he preaches here and teaches, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that he may have a long-lasting life in thy service. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that I will be with the elders here and the deacons and be with the, all of us, Heavenly Father, to do your will in each and everything that we do. Strengthen us daily. Strengthen us where we're weak. Help us to be strong in the faith. Forgive us of our sins. And he's blessing we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Speaking how I love to proclaim it, reading my love. is this, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost 
over 300 games in my career. I've been given the ball 26 times to take the last minute or last second shot and miss. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. Sounds pretty sad, doesn't it? If you look at it as a basketball player, you say, how in the world did they ever let him out on the basketball court? to miss 9,000 shots. But if you look at who said that, it may put a little different perspective on it. Probably one of the greatest basketball players of all time, if not the greatest basketball player of all time, Michael Jordan is the one who made that statement. Missed 9,000 shots, lost 300 games, or over 300 games, 26 times he missed the game-winning shot in the last second. You know, when I think about him and I think about the statement that he made, I just want you to know that I didn't read all of it. I need to read the last phrase that he put in it. So let's just look at it again. He says, I missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games, or over 300 games, rather. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game, make, take the game winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. And that is why I succeed. He misses a shot, what does he do? He takes another shot. He misses the game-winning shot, what does he do? He takes another one. And you know what? Whenever I think about him, I think about success. In the book of Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, the Apostle Paul wrote and said, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining toward, uh, forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Forgetting what lies behind. Forgetting 9,000 missed shots. Forgetting 300 lost games forgetting 26 times that he missed on the final shot. All the little sins, all the missed opportunities to demonstrate love and compassion and kindness, all the times I've lacked enough faith to step up, to speak up, to man up, all the past failures and all the good I've neglected to do. I have to get past those things and press on. Paul said, I press on toward the goal for the high calling of God. What you may not realize is that Jordan made 12,156 shots. He won 706 games in his career, and 28 times he took that last second shot and hit it. So he did more, he succeeded more than he failed in his life. And you know what? We can win the prize of life if we do not let the past get us down. Do we let it drag us down sometimes? Yes, we do. We focus on the failures. We look at the bad things and we think, I can't. I've messed up so many times, how could I ever move forward? But I have to. Like Paul, we have to press on toward the goal if we want to reach that goal. It may be tonight you've never obeyed the gospel. The Lord's invitation is open to you tonight. It may be tonight that there's something in your life that you need to make right in a public way. If we can assist you with either of these tonight, why don't you come right now as we stand and as we sing. There's a fountain for you and me.
last time on Acts chapter 13, verse number 34. We were still there with a couple of other things I mentioned that we wanted to talk about. As we look at the verse, the verse simply says, and as far as the fact, and as for the fact, rather, that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Now what we were focusing on last time is the phrase where he says he will never more return to corruption or never return, will not, uh, no more return to corruption. And we focused on that. And the thing that we noted about that, it's a little bit different than what he says in the next verse that, that we'll talk about more in just a second. But he says he'll no more return. If You, you have to uh, have been somewhere before you can return there. And so we talked about that. When God created man, he took the man from what? From the ground. He took him from the dust of the earth, the Bible says, and formed him into a, a man and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so when we, when we look at that, when we think about it, we have to understand that Jesus' fleshly body was like the fleshly body of every other person who's ever lived. If you leave it alone after it dies, what happens? It's going to eventually disintegrate. It came from the earthly elements, if you will. It came from the things that, that uh, are, are organic in nature. And so uh, we, have, we have that particular thing. And I'm not sure, and I didn't go back and watch the video, but uh, I'm not sure, but I wanted to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52, and then a little bit farther down in, in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, because it applies directly to what we're looking at here. Jesus did not see corruption, the Bible says. He did not return to corruption. But when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52, Paul wrote and said, Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. That is, we won't all die. That's the idea that he's putting forth there. But we shall all be changed in, the moment, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, how? Incorruptible or imperishable, depending upon which translation you're reading from. This is the opposite of what the body does when it dies now. It's resurrected, and it will never again return to corruption or to perishability from the standpoint of this organic matter that this physical body that we have, that it's been made up with, it's going to be different. It's going to be changed. And so it'll, it won't have the same properties that it has at this point. If you go on down to verses 53 and 54, though, this is the interesting part. He says, for this perishable body, perishable being the corruptible body, the one that, that, that decays, that disintegrates into the dust again, this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. What does that mean? Death is swallowed up in victory. It has something to do with this physical body being resurrected, doesn't it? Death is over. And as a result of that, what happens? Our bodies that have now become immortal and imperishable, they'll never again return to corruptibility, they'll never again turn to corruption again. Death for us is finished. I don't know if you've ever noticed it or not. This doesn't cost a bit more. But the word that's used here, swallowed up, is also used in the book of First Peter chapter 1, where he talks about uh, uh, the devil as a roaring lion, roaming about, seeking whom he may devour. Same word. Death is devoured in victory. It's chewed up. It's gone. And so the idea of the corruptibility of the body is something that we, need to, that we need to look at, we need to think about, we need to study about, 
and learn as much about as we possibly can while we're here on this earth in order to settle and ease our own minds and help us to understand and know just a little bit of the taste of what it is going to be like in heaven. We're not going to be a bunch of disembodied spirits that are floating around in heaven. We're going to have a body, but it's not going to be, it'll be related to this body, but it won't be like this body from the standpoint that it can die and it will rot back into the ground. All right, still in verse 34, he says, uh, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Now, all of the, the, the giving of the holy and sure blessings of David is, is based upon what? According to this verse, the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead, he'll never return to corruption again. The, the, the holy and sure blessings of David. This is taken from Isaiah chapter 55 at verse number 3. When he makes this idea, this statement about giving the holy and sure blessings of David, it's taken from first, or rather Isaiah chapter 55, verse number 3. The passage there says, Incline your ear and come to me here, and your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure, steadfast, sure love for David. And so when he says here that he's going to give him the the holy and sure blessings of David, what, to what does he refer from Isaiah 55, verse number 3? What did he say he was going to make? A covenant. Well, what covenant is it? There was an old covenant, was there not? And in the book of Hebrews, we read about a new covenant. What's different from the, what makes the new covenant different from the old covenant? Yeah, what makes it different? Under the old covenant, there was no forgiveness of sins. Under the new covenant, what Paul's talking about here, there is forgiveness of sins. And so, you know, we read that in the book of Hebrews, and we understand it from there. It's an everlasting covenant that is going to continue on. Yes, you're correct. But this everlasting covenant is the one that brings forth eternal life as well from Freedom from the sins that we have in our lives. And so when Paul is writing about that, or talking about it rather, here in the book of First Corinthians, or in the book of Acts, I'm still stuck on 1 Corinthians 15 for some reason. Tried to say it with Isaiah and tried to say it with Acts. But right here, when we're looking at what he says uh, there, in, in this passage in the book of Acts, we, we understand the blessing to be the covenant that he has given. Now, if you're reading from the King James or the New King James in Acts chapter 13, verse 34, it's a little bit different, isn't it? Translated a little differently there. ESV says the holy and what? Sure blessings of David. King James and New King James speak about the sure mercies of David. <clears throat> When we, when we think about that, again, it simply refers back to what we've already said. The sure mercies that God had promised to David is, again, that idea of forgiveness of sin, the mercy that God would show to his people. Now, there, uh, you've heard me say it before. The King James and New King James are based on different texts, different manuscripts, if you will, than the ESV. And so the ESV doesn't have exactly the same words in the older, ESV uses older manuscripts than does the King James and the New King James. And it doesn't have the exact same words. It uses the word, one word, which is holy. Now when you think about something being holy, what do you think about? To you, what does the word holy mean? <clears throat> If you just give the normal definition, it's something that is set apart from other things, isn't it? It's not common. It's set apart. Well, you know how to ask that for a reason, don't you? 
the word translated holy here is not the normal word for holy. It's a different word. The word that's used in this verse that's translated holy in the ESV means sanctioned by the supreme law of God. Supremely holy. Pledged. Pledged bounties or mercies from God. The word is used again in this same text. If you drop to the very next verse, the same word is used, and yet it's translated a little bit differently in that verse 35. You will not let your holy one, your holy, that holy one and the holy that's mentioned up here in verse number 34, those are the same words used very seldom in the New Testament. And so the one that is being spoken of there in verse number 35 is who? Who is the Holy One? Jesus. I mean, that should be obvious to us. It's Jesus. But the point that Paul makes with the word that he uses is this one who has been given, this Holy One, is the supremely Holy One who has been pledged by God. The, the covenant of which we were speaking about in verse number 34 had been pledged to David by God. And Christ is the one who has been pledged to mankind through David and others by God. The supremely holy one who has been pledged by God. The supremely holy covenant that has been pledged by God, verse number 34. Now is the New Testament better than the Old Testament? The New Covenant, is it better than the Old Covenant? Absolutely. 110% plus some. It is that much better. Because through that we have what? I've said it before. Forgiveness of sins which leads to eternal life. Eternal life. And so Paul is making a, Paul is saying a mouthful, let me just say it that way, with what he says in, uh, in this uh, statement that he makes here. All right, going on, let's move on to verse number 35. Therefore, he says, also in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. And we've already talked a little bit about the Holy One. Let's go back and talk about what he says you will see or you have, uh, uh, him saying in another psalm. Where, where did he get that from? I'm sorry? Somebody said it, I think. Psalm 1610, that's exactly right. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol and, or let your Holy One see corruption. Psalm 16, <laughs> verse number 10. Now the word see, as is used here, is the actual word for see. But it's used in a figurative way, isn't it? He won't see corruption. That is, he won't experience it. All right? He won't, uh, that, that body that he has, it won't decay. It's not, gonna, it's not going to decay in the ground. When he was murdered, God would raise him before that, that could happen. Now, we've already dealt with this idea of not seeing corruption, haven't we? And somebody says we've dealt with it over and over and over again. Well, Paul mentioned it again, so we've got to talk more about it, right? If it was important enough for Paul to say it at least twice here, he must have something to say about it, doesn't he? And so there's still a number of things that we could talk about. When Jesus was raised from the dead, what part of Jesus was raised from the dead? His body was raised from the dead. Now you can go back and trace it through. Uh, Matthew 27, 58 and 59. When uh, Joseph went to Pilate, what did he ask for? According to that verse. The body of Jesus. In Matthew, or rather Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 3. When the women went to the uh, graveside on that Sunday morning, what did they not find? 
the body of Jesus. Uh, in John chapter 20, verse number 12, the two angels in white who were sitting there where the body of Jesus had lain. And so again, what was raised from the dead? The same thing that was put in there. The body of Jesus was raised from the dead. But why in the world does Paul keep repeating this about the body of Jesus not seeing corruption? Is it something that he needs to hammer home to us? I mean, don't we understand? Well, yes, he died. He was in the grave for three days, or at least parts of three days. And he raised him from the dead. Ain't that enough? Do we just go on? Forget about what the rest of what Paul says here? Well, what part of the Bible can we just skip over and not, not get something out of it? During the mid to late first century, not too far distant from the time that Paul is speaking here in Antioch of Pisidia, there was a heresy that began to develop. Now, it wasn't fully developed until the second century, okay? But it had its roots here in the mid to late part of the first century. It would later come to be known as docetism, D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M, docetism. Docetism, here's a word you probably have heard before if you were in our first John class, ever how many years ago that's been, we talked about Gnosticism. Docetism is one aspect of Gnosticism. One of the, uh, some of the things that are said in Docetism are foundational principles of Gnosticism. Now, I said that. Do I want you to remember the name Docetism? No, not necessarily. I just told you the name of it. You can go back and uh, search it and study more about it if you want to. But... The doctrine of docetism held that evil was, uh, that flesh or matter rather was evil and spirit was good. Flesh, matter, evil. Spirit, good. You can hopefully see where this is going. Because of the belief that matter was evil, docetists began to assert that Christ was born without any participation of matter or flesh, and that all the acts and sufferings of the life of Jesus, including the crucifixion itself, were mere phantom appearances. Mere appearances. It was like a phantom. Jesus was like a phantom. In other words, let me just put it a different way. Their teaching was Jesus did not have a real or natural body while on earth. He just appeared to have one. Now this doctrine developed not long after Paul is talking here in Antioch of Pisidia. What do you think God in his infinite wisdom by saying the things or having Paul say the things that he had him say was heading off. It could be nipped in the bud, as Barney Fife used to say, if people would just have listened to what Paul said over and over again. By the way, Paul was not the only one, was he? Prophecy had been made back in the Old Testament. Peter, Peter back in Acts chapter 2, had dealt with it too, hadn't he? about the body, Christ not seeing corruption. And so when we, when we are looking at the passage here, we see this, uh, this idea uh, being uh, headed off. Now John would write somewhat about it. Go with me in your Bible. Turn over there. It's not going to be on the screen. To 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. And if Paul didn't demolish the idea that Jesus didn't have a body, John will. 
1 John chapter number 4. Let's look at verses 1 through 3 there. Uh, before we read that, though, when, when was John written? 1 John, rather. Have any idea, any clue? Somewhere between probably 85 and 90 A.D. So we're talking late first century. Before Revelation, who was written, which was written by John, but late in the first century, most likely closer to 90 A.D. And so if this begins to take root in the mid-first century, surely John's going to have something to say. Matter of fact, John is probably still the only apostle left at this time. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Beloved, I do not, or do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. What's he talking about, teachers? Whatever you're being taught, make sure you're being taught something that's coming from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come. Now what is the next part of that in the flesh. The one who confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Does not confess what about Jesus? Contextually that he has come in the flesh. The sarx. That's what the word is. The flesh. The same thing that has a body just like everybody else has. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. The spirit of the Antichrist was what? Jesus hasn't come in the flesh or at least a part of it. That false teaching was a part of it. No wonder Paul's hammering it back there. He's trying to guard them against something that would happen later on while proving that Jesus is the very Savior of the world who lived in the body, who died and was resurrected by God. You know what? That's not all that John has to say about that. There are other things that we could deal with, but Go to, back to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter number 1. And look at the very first verse of 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and have done what with? Touched with our hands. Touch, touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Who did they touch with their hands? <clears throat> Jesus, the Son of God. When did they touch him with their hands? The word touch here is a word which means to touch by feeling and handling implying movement over a surface. Your feeling of something. That's the word touch there. Not that we, ah, we touched him. You know, the kids in the back of the car when you're riding down the road, he touched me. Some of y'all smile like I've heard that before. All it had done was put a finger, you know, pointed at him, but the word here is not, okay, I touched him. I touched him. I felt of him. That exact same word is used back in Luke chapter 24. In Luke 24, look at verse number 39. This is on the day that Jesus had been raised from the dead. He appears to his apostles. Now one of them's not there, but the 11 or the 10 are. Okay? And what does he say? When he gets there talking to those apostles who are in that room. Verse 39 says, See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch 
me. And see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Jesus' body was raised from the dead. And after it was raised from the dead, what could the apostles do? By the way, let me ask it this way. What did they do? Now, we fought old Thomas, who wasn't there with them. He said, unless I can see him, and unless I can put my hand in the nail scars and, you know, the things that he said, put it in the side where the spear has been, I won't believe that it's him. Jesus had already told the apostles that he appeared to before he appeared to Thomas the next week. What? Beloved me. It's me. How do I know they touched him? Because John said they did. Didn't he? Did we not just read that in the book of 1 John? Sure we did. He had a body. And what's more, he had a body of what sort? Even after his resurrection, he had a body of what sort? A body of flesh and blood. A physical body. A body made of matter. Now we say, what happened to that body? What's going to happen to the bodies of those who are still alive and those who actually come out of the grave when Jesus comes again? We will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye Paul would write back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 we'll be changed and so yes Paul talks about the body by the way Paul is not finished talking about this body this, this body that didn't see corruption in Acts 13 he's going to do it again but we need to grasp a, a good understanding and a good reason for Paul repeating that over and over and over again. Verse number 35. Right. He's going to talk about that. Yep. He's going to talk about it. Matter of fact, the next, uh, the next verse, verse number 36, he's going to talk about that. But at the same time, what he's saying to them He's saying by inspiration, and when he said it by inspiration, what did he do to these false doctrines that would come along later? Destroyed them. Destroyed them. Mightily destroyed them. Verse 36. For David, now who, who, the, who is the psalmist that he's been speaking about? The psalmist wrote, second psalm, he mentioned the second psalm, uh, two or three verses above. Another psalm says... He says, for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and did what? If you want to be gross about it, his body rotted, didn't it? He, he saw corruption. It is back with the dust. This very day. Was back then, but it still is on this very day. Now, looking at verse 36 again, I want you to just briefly refer back to verse number 22. When Jesus, or when Paul is telling about David taking the place of Saul, he, he replaced Saul with a man after his own heart, right? And we pointed out back then something, and I think I said that's going to become important a little bit later. But when he said, I've found a man after my own heart, he added something to that. What was it? Who will do my all my will? He'll do all my will. Now back to verse 36. After he had served the purpose of God in his own generation. I asked the question back then, 
Did David do all that God wanted done? Evidently he did. And that seems to be confirmed right here in this verse, doesn't it? He served his purpose. But what purpose? The purpose of God. David did the will of God. Did David always do the will of God? Nope, he wasn't perfect. But as king, did David do the will of God? Yep. He accomplished the things that David or that God wanted him to do. By the way, I just preached on this uh, last week, last Thursday. <clears throat> Y'all remember Samson? Samson was a strong guy, wasn't he? Until he had a whiny wife, a whiny wife that had him got his hair cut off, right? Well, when his hair was cut off, what did he lose? Why did he lose his strength? Because he, had it, because he didn't have long hair anymore? No, the, the breaking of the Nazarite vow, one of the ways that it was shown was you cut your hair. So his vow to God had been broken. That's not what I wanted to talk about. What I wanted to talk about, you know, Samson was pretty sinful, wasn't he? But when it was announced that he was to be born, what did the angel tell his mother? He will begin to deliver the Israelites from the Philistines. Focus on the word begin. Who ultimately did that? Who's, who was in the will of God to ultimately overcome the Philistines? It was David. He served the purpose of God in his own generation. All right? And so as we look at him, we, we want to talk a little bit more about him. Uh, David accomplished the will that uh, God had for him to the purpose that God had for him to do. And after that was done, he died. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse number 10. Then David slept with his fathers was buried in the city of David. City of David being what? Where was he buried? In where was Jesus born? <laughs> the city of David, Bethlehem. So that's where David, David, David was buried. Where's David's body now? It's rotted, it's decayed. So Paul makes the point, when David was writing these things, it may have had some primary application to him and to the things that were going on. I think we showed the other day that, that some of the things that were prophesied had direct application to Solomon in the primary sense, but in the New Testament, the real thing that was being spoken about was Christ. The same thing is true with David here. But Paul points out, just as Peter had done, David's still dead. But Jesus, who has this body, that will never return to corruption is still alive. He's back. He is here. Okay? Verse 37. But him whom God raised up did not see. There it is again. He did not see corruption. Now he's repeating himself in regard to David, showing that, that, David, uh, that Christ was, was different. Whom God raised up. Jesus was raised on what day? Not the day of the week, but how long had he been dead? Raised on the third day. As a result of that, his body didn't have time to decay, did it? Think with me about something. In all actuality, how long would Jesus have been dead? When we think three days, if there's 24 hours in a day, 24, 24, 48, 24, 72, was Jesus dead 72 hours? Do you realize Jesus was dead between 36 and 40 hours only? Likely closer to 36 hours. 
That's not three days, is it? But as the Jews count time, he died on Friday. He was in the grave on Saturday and was in the grave apart of Sunday. Now, thinking about that, let's see if we can figure out how many hours he was in the grave. Matthew 27, 45 through 47. Now, from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Is that the last thing Jesus said? Nope, not the last thing he said. But when did he say that? About the ninth hour. Now, question. Somebody translate that for me. What time of day was it in our speak? About 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 3 o'clock. What day was it? On a Friday. 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday. Now he said that about 3 o'clock. Look at Luke chapter 23, verses 44 through 46. It was about the 6th hour. There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now Luke doesn't tell us at what point Jesus said that, does he? But what, by reading Matthew, can we determine? It had to have been sometime around the night hour after he said Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Now did Jesus say, Father into thy hands I commit my spirit immediately after he said Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? How do you know that? Because the people standing around said what? He's calling for Elijah. Let's see if Elijah comes and brings him down. And so you've got some time elapsed there. And so we know that it has to be sometime around a little after perhaps the ninth hour or three o'clock in the afternoon. Now, let's fast forward to Sunday. John chapter 20 at verse number one. What time was he raised from the dead? What does John 20 verse number one say? On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. How early was it? While it was still dark. What time did the sun rise in Palestine? Most likely we would consider it to be somewhere around 6 a.m. Somebody who's a better mathematician than me can count better. Count from 3 o'clock on Friday to 6 o'clock on Sunday morning and see what you get. How many, is, how many hours is that? From 3 o'clock on Friday to 3 o'clock on Saturday is 24. And then from 3 o'clock until 6 o'clock in the morning now. <clears throat> 12 more, be 36. Yeah, so we're looking at less than 40 hours. And by the way, when Mary came, while it was still dark, what had already happened? He, would, he had already been raised and was gone. So we know it had to be less than 40 hours time that Jesus was in the grave. Did not see corruption. Now, why did I bring all of that to your attention. You can search it online. There are different places that you can, can see forensic analysis of not Jesus, but of, of life and bodies and things like that. I found this one on what are the four stages of human decomposition. Boy, just think of somebody at the FBI comes and searches my computer He's looking about how to decompose a body. No, I was looking about how long it takes for a reason for tonight. 
between 24 and 72 hours after death, the internal organs begin to decompose. Between three and five days after death, the body starts to bloat and blood, contain, blood containing foam leaks from the mouth and the nose, three to five days. Eight to 10 days after death, the body turns from green to red as the blood decomposes and the organs in the abdomen accumulate gases. Several weeks after death, the nails and the teeth fall out. One month after death, the body starts to liquefy. Go back to the first one. 24 to 72 hours, the internal organs begin to decompose. But Jesus was in the grave how long? He was only dead how long? Probably between 36 and 40 hours. He didn't even have time for his internal organs to begin to decompose. No wonder, Paul said, three times already in this one sermon, he didn't see corruption. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Science itself shows the Bible to be true. Did not see corruption. All right? Moving on. Let's go on to verse number 38. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Hasn't that been his whole point the whole time that he's been talking about this? Let it be proclaimed. The one who's raised from the dead, never to decompose, what did he bring? The holy and sure promises that had been given to David. But what was that? We said it a while ago, the covenant that brought forth forgiveness. Let it be known that this man, this man who didn't decay, who was raised from the dead, has brought this forgiveness that I'm talking about today. That's what he said, that I'm proclaiming to you. Verse 39, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. D does it make sense when you read that verse, what we've been saying about this other covenant? You couldn't be freed from something by the law of Moses. What could you not be freed under the law of Moses from? Couldn't be freed from your sins. So we've got a contrast between the old and the new, don't we? We've got exactly what we said that was prophesied back in the Psalms, the, the, the promise that was given, the sure and holy and the steadfast, and depending on which translation you're reading from, the things that were given promised to David, the blessings promised to him. And Paul is saying, right now, I'm telling you about those. You've been looking for them, haven't you? To whom had Paul been speaking here in Antioch of Pisidia? Where was he when he was preaching this sermon? He's at the synagogue. Who's there? Jews are there and also proselytes, Gentiles who had uh, accepted the Jewish religion as their own faith. And if they had accepted the Jewish religion, what were they looking for? A Messiah? Now, they didn't get the, the right idea about him. They thought he was coming to help them out with the Romans. But he says, you've been looking for him, and I'm telling you about him. And that's his, that's his point. Now, the law of Moses was never designed to take man's sins away. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. The sacrifices of the bulls and the goats... What could they never do? Take away the sins. In Galatians chapter 3, verse number 19, Why then the law, Paul writes, it was added because of transgressions until the offering sh uh, offspring should come to whom the promise had been made and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. 
Romans 10 verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The Old Testament didn't have what it took. It had its purpose. It was good. Paul, Paul said, am I saying it's not good? No. It was good for its purpose, but its purpose was not complete. It told us about the one who would bring something complete. Now the word freed in the last minute or two that we've got is interesting. If you're reading from the King James or the English Standard Version, you might notice that there is a note beside the word freed in your Bible. There's a little three beside mine, and the little three says this, or justified. And, and if you're looking at the King James and the New King James, both of them translate the word as justified. And a number of times in the New Testament when we find this word, the word is translated by some form of justified. Justified, justified, justification, and so forth. But here, as we look at it, according to the New Testament Word Dictionary, in Acts 13.39, that's where we are, it is used with a preposition apo, from referring to, uh, which means from, referring to all those things from the Mosaic law uh, could not, uh, from which the Mosaic law could not liberate us. In this instance, therefore, as well as in Romans chapter 6 at verse number 7 where he talks about us being freed from our sin, uh, where the same wording is used there, he said it refers to our liberation from something, sin which holds man as a prisoner or slave. The verb that's used here is similar to a verb that's used in other places translated to deliver, to set free from. And so the idea is not just that we've been justified, treated just as if we haven't sinned, but the idea is that we've literally been released like a slave has been released from the sins that we have through the forgiveness that's found in Christ Jesus. All right? All right, we will pick up next time in uh, verse number 40. Verse number 40. Let's close with a prayer. Father in heaven, we're so thankful again for the life that we've been blessed with. Father, we're thankful for the blessings that you give us each day. May we never take these things for granted. But Father, may we always remember that you are the source of every blessing that we receive. Father, we're especially thankful for our mind and our abilities to, to study and to understand. And we pray, Father, that classes like the one that we've participated in tonight will stretch our understanding, that will help us to grow our faith, and that, Heavenly Father, we can be more pleasing to you through the things that we learned. Father, be with those who are sick, those who will be undergoing surgeries. We pray that you will watch over and protect them. <coughs> Be with each one of us as we leave this place tonight. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.